there's another one there. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, being here tonight. Um, this is a very exciting night for uh, the family of the investigative journal. I'd like to begin by um, thanking Mr. Yusri Ishak. He's the founder and chairman, the brainchild behind this uh, project. It's not easy for him. He's a man who started his career in the 80s in landscaping and a uh, little bit of construction and now he's getting into journalism. And he got into it much earlier, but uh, this is the big one. Miss Jane Kahani, sitting in the back there, trying to hide. She's That's a very good friend of mine. That's my name, sorry, she's, um, my name. Know that. The, <laughs> she was the chief editor of the investigative journal. She's done an incredible job um, with us. And we're here today to announce the official launch of the project that started in uh, February. Uh, the investigative journal basically focuses on what you don't got much of in the mainstream media. Uh, we're looking into health, environment, terrorism, press freedom, and anyone One who has a good grip on a story is more than welcome to join and say hello and bring their ideas. Uh, it's interesting if you look at our board of advisors, which we dub the board of prisoners. Um, we have five of our members who are, who have been incarcerated, 
uh, harassed, kidnapped, um, but they continued their mission of trying to bring the truth. Mr. Taha Siddiqui is going to be speaking today. He uh, survived an abduction attempt. We have Lindsay Snell, who was uh, kidnapped by Al Qaeda, a Nusra Front in Syria, and uh, she survived. Mr. Theo Padnus, who also survived Al Qaeda, um, and other members of the team, uh, like Mr. Martin Shibi, who was jailed for 438 days in uh, Africa for a crime he didn't commit. It resonates a little bit with me because I went through an experience like that in Egypt where I was jailed for um, fabricated terrorism charges. And it taught me so much, and it taught me the most important thing is that journalists should never be on this side of the, mi of, of the microphone and become the story. You know, I don't want to be on this side. I want to be telling the story. But when you become the story, you need everybody there for you. And uh, I wonder if you think how you would handle being in a solitary confinement cell. It's surprising. We are much stronger than we think we are. Your body becomes stronger. You become more resilient. And it doesn't become about you anymore. It just becomes about, you know, the bigger cause of press freedom. Why you're out there getting the story. You know, it's never about the money. Any journalist in the room here knows very well, and we have some of the best, that, um, you know, you're working all the time with pleasure. You know, when you have Ms. Maria Risa here, who's going to uh, share her wealth of information and the war stories in the Philippines, you know, um, it's inspiring for me, and that is why I joined TIJ. Um, but while I was preparing for this conference, uh, I remembered a very good friend of mine back in Vancouver, Canada, um, Ms. Pearl, Tamara Pearl. She's the sister of Mr. Uh, Daniel Pearl. God bless him. The late Daniel Pearl was kidnapped in Pakistan four days after 9-11. And unfortunately, God bless him, uh, he was killed. And in the video message she's going to, we're going to play today, um, she clearly states that her main source of information when her brother was in the hands of these ruthless people was coming from investigative journalists. And that's what it's all about digging for the truth in this Trumpified era where we're, try we're being manipulated. And just before I go and you know, play this video, I'd just like to mention the numbers. You know, in 2004, when I stood in court in front of a judge, I was surprised that there were 200 journalists behind bars for crimes they didn't commit. And then here I am, it's 340 plus journalists incarcerated, almost a double, uh, according to RSF, and eight who have been killed and 60 who uh, have been taken hostage. So we can't normalize this. We cannot accept this. And that is why I'm extremely happy, and I'd like to announce tonight that um, the investigative journal has uh, partnered with uh, Rappler in the Philippines, we have the CEO here. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, it's a, it's a pleasure. Um, we're going to be cooperating on investigations and trying to bring you uh, the truth, everything that's out there, you know, and in all, from all kinds of fields. And we are emboldened by our board of prisoners. And um, I'd like to play the video. Uh, Ms. Tamara Pearl, she's the... Uh, Vice President of the Daniel Pearl Foundation, and they still bring journalists from Pakistan to the US and train them, young journalists. That's their mission. Uh, so please allow me to play this video for you. Hi, I'm Tamara Pearl, Daniel Pearl's sister, and the Vice President of the Daniel Pearl Foundation. I'd like to thank Mohammed, who I met when he was living in Vancouver, for inviting me to the launch. 
I'm not able to be there in person, so I'm sending these few words. I'm very excited to hear about the investigative journal. Uh, I'm excited to hear about the work that it's already doing and the work that it plans to do. Exposing injustice is crucial for human rights, but exposing injustice is dangerous. Investigative journalists need protection and support and to know how valued their work is for each and every one of us, each of us who wants to live in communities that value human life and dignity. Danny was based in India as the South Asia Bureau Chief of the Wall Street Journal. He loved people, he loved his job, and he loved traveling the world. But he was cautious. His wife was pregnant and he refused to go into Afghanistan after 9-11. He went to Pakistan instead. On January 23, 2002, he was kidnapped by members of a local Pakistani terrorist organization who then sold him to Al-Qaeda. Much of what we know about the many people who were involved in his kidnapping and murder is from investigative journalists, who I still call to verify what is published from time to time about his killers. I don't need to tell you how devastating this was for all of us who love Danny. Out of a desire to turn our pain into something helpful, we created the Daniel Pearl Foundation. One of our programs is to, is to bring mid-career journalists from countries that don't have a free press for six-month fellowships on news outlets in the United States. This experience often motivates them to go back to their countries and write on complex topics. For example, Umar Chima, who is an investigative journalist based out of Islamabad, returned to Pakistan after his fellowship and published two groundbreaking reports exposing rampant tax evasion among top Pakistani officials. In 2010, he was abducted and tortured. But he says he remains committed to the collective struggle no matter what the cost. Silence, he says, is not an option. He tells us that after his traumatic experience, the knowledge that my parents and our organization and our contacts were behind him gave him the strength to go to the police. This is the support that the investigative journalists need, the strength of those who understand how utterly critical their role is for all of us who stand behind them. All of you who are present today provide that strength through your support of the investigative journal. In the past, many journalists felt that they held a special position that gave them a kind of immunity that rose from their supposed neutrality or objectivity. Now journalists are targeted by governments as a method of control or are used as pawns by terrorists as Danny was, or are um, killed as a result of exposing corruption and organized crime. They are killed for where they are, for what they write, or for who they are. The video of Danny's death was titled Slaughter of the Spy Jew. Whether they are seen as spies or threats or traitors, the idea that journalists are the enemy is rising. To counteract that, it is imperative that we emphasize why it is so important that we have professional journalists in the field and why their safety is our safety. In May of 2010, Obama signed the Daniel Pearl Freedom of the Press Act, which required the State Department to add reports on the assault and imprisonment of journalists around the world in their yearly human rights report. As an interesting aside, Vice President Mike Pence, who was then a congressman, was one of the sponsors of the bill. These reports are online and can be viewed country by country. More protections need to be in place. When journalists are imprisoned, missing, kidnapped, or murdered, we all suffer because the truth is threatened. Thank you to everyone involved in the investigative journal for recognizing the urgency of the kind of work you are supporting. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, I'd like to say uh, welcome to Lise Doucette in sitting in the back, the BBC, old friend of mine, just saw her, and um, Mr. Darren from Amnesty, Mr. Stefan uh, from Amnesty, good friends, very happy to have you all here and everyone else. And uh, now Ms. Yalda Hakim, she's going to be uh, moderating the event tonight. Uh, please take the show.
Thank you so much, Mohammed. Um, I spoke to Mohammed last week and I told him that uh, it's been a long time since I've been so excited about an event. Um, I gave birth about five or six weeks ago and so it took uh, something like this to bring me out of the house, um, such an important cause, and to be sharing a platform with uh, the most extraordinary journalists like uh, Maria Ressa, who has spent uh, the last 30 years or so speaking truth to power, and of course, Kareem and Taha, who uh, are currently living in exile, uh, who have faced intimidation and risked their lives, lives to tell the stories of their communities, their country and their regions, and of course, uh, the world. So uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming here tonight. And um, I'm very much looking forward to speaking to Maria as well as the other journalists uh, here uh, on the panel. But I'd like to, to now introduce Maria Ressa, one of the world's most well-regarded journalist who has been prosecuted, jailed, continues to be intimidated uh, for getting on the wrong side of the president of the Philippines. And uh, we'll be speaking uh, some more to her, but she'll be our keynote speaker. So if you could please uh, welcome uh, Maria to the stage. I seem taller than I really am here, aren't I? <laughs> it's a great vantage point. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, it is so nice to see so many friends here as well and to see Bobby. <laughs> and, um, so the title of what I'm going to, the speech I, I wrote for you is actually creating the future together. Creating the future together, except that it is about dealing with the destruction that we're living through now, right? Seeing Tamara Pearl reminded me I was in touch with Omar Sheikh and tried to get CNN at that point to send me to Karachi. They refused. And I, while I railed against that at that time, you know, it's a far more dangerous world. And those were the times when it was turning. So thank you first for inviting me tonight. I mean, this is such a special night, the launch of the investigative journal. It is also an existential moment not just for journalism, we know this, we talk about this, but it is also an existential moment for all democracies around the world. We're living in truly unprecedented times where dealing with the dis creative destruction that we're dealing with, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Where crisis is opportunity and fear can either save your life or doom your future. So. Make no mistake about this. Journalism really is in crisis. We are under attack, not just as sustainable news organizations, but as individual journalists, where online violence easily turns into real world violence. The exponential attacks and lies on social media are familiar to you here, as they're familiar in the United States and many other democracies around the world. After all, President Duterte was elected just a month before Brexit. And like in other parts of the world, disinformation networks. I'm not gonna call it misinformation, it is disinformation networks. They pound the fracture lines of society, spreading hate and violence, fomenting, they're forming these violent ghettos that divide our societies and ultimately they weaken our democracies. The Philippines is your cautionary tale. It is both a curse and a privilege to be a senior journalist in my country today. On the one hand, the baton has been passed to us, to my generation, uh, Liz's generation. It's, so the baton was passed to us at this, I know it's a historic moment. We're gonna look back 10 years from now, we're gonna look at this and say, this is a critical moment in history. Everything is changing and every decision we make can change what our future is going to look like. But on the other hand, staying silent, you heard Tamara say it, silence is actually complicity. And not speaking is consent to unspeakable violence and to impunity. Not just in the Philippines' brutal drug war, which the UN estimates have killed more than 27,000 people since July 2016. That's a huge number, but 
Aside from that impunity, you're also talking about the insidious mass manipulation of information, of information operations in our society. A lie told a million times, pounded a million times, becomes fact. And if you're a traditional news group and you don't respond, which is what we were all told to do, you've just helped the lie become a fact. This is why our world is upside down, because without facts, we don't have truth. Without truth, we have no trust. Journalists are the gatekeepers of facts, right? And while the social media platforms have taken over and they've become the world's largest distributor of news, they didn't take the gatekeeping powers. So here we are in our generation trying to fight for the facts. That is the battle of our generation. This. Well, with, without truth, there's no trust. The voice with the loudest megaphone with the most power wins. The pattern of exponential attacks and lies on social media is clear in my country, in the Philippines. And this is, I'll describe it for you and I think you'll find it's familiar. It's bottom up astroturfing, fake grass, right? It's just the lie keeps going and there's a bandwagon effect and people think that there are a lot more people that, that believe that. Then on the side, there's co-opted media or state proxies that hit laterally. And then finally, the last part is top down. Um, so it's bottom up, lateral, and top down. Uh, in my case, it took about a year with these exponential attacks. And then a year, about a year later, President Duterte said the exact same thing, the exact same lie, which is that Rappler is 100% American owned. Um, and he didn't say it in a press conference. He said it in his State of the Nation address. So here I was covering it and I just you know, tweeted immediately, Mr. President, you're wrong. <laughs> anyway, yeah. these were the attacks against Rappler, the startup that we created against me, against journalists, against anyone who's perceived to question. Why is questioning criminal? Um, our investigative journalists in Rappler have documented it all. This is what we need to do. We document. We shine the light. It is our best defense, and it is our only, our only defense. But when you shine the light, there are consequences, right? So from January 2018, the Philippine government filed at least 11 cases and investigations against me and Rappler. In a little more than three months, I had to post bail eight times. In a five-week period around Valentine's Day, I was arrested twice. I was detained. My Valentine's gift from my government was allowing me to post bail. I've always wanted to experience as much of life as I can. We all do. That's why we also became journalists, right? But you know the going to jail part? That part, uh, I could do without. Um, <laughs> Because my only crime is to do what I have always done in more than three decades. That is to be a journalist, to speak truth to power. So what can we do? Well, it's clear that our, our industry and one nation alone can't solve this problem. Because local is global. The problems in the Philippines were spurred by social media platforms, decisions that were made outside of our country. Local is global, and global is local. The online attacks against me were enabled. Technology was the accelerator, and we've seen this in many other parts of the world. Don't get me wrong. Uh, these are the same American social media platforms that also allowed us to create Rappler in 2012. At that time, we grew 100%, to 300% year on year in terms of reach and revenue. We couldn't have challenged traditional news groups without this. So I know what's good about it, right? And I, I don't want to get rid of it, which is why we continue working with them. But in 2016, something went drastically wrong. That was when the world changed, when we again clearly saw that whoever controls the information gains power. Information is power. The irony, of course, is that most of the countries most affected by these algorithms, by what you created in the West, um, countries in the global south, like the Philippines, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, our countries are the ones most affected because our institutions are extremely weak. 
and yet we don't have a seat at the table. So here's the upside. Today that is changing. I'm here, right? That's pretty good. That's, um, so global is local and local is global, where investigative journalism and cross-border collaboration is needed more today than ever. And not one news group alone can do it. We need to collaborate in the same way these disinformation networks are collaborating and building a web. It's like a terrorist network running throughout that is pounding that is making lies facts, right? This is part of the reason we decided at Rappler to partner with the investigative journal. We wanted to learn about other parts of the world. We need to do cross-border collaboration because that's the way crime moves, right? I first met Fami last April at the Clooney Foundation's launch of Trial Watch. We were on stage, he was on my right, um, and I listened to him. Uh, Trial Watch was a global effort to let captured systems of justice know that the world is watching. Journalists need something like this, right? During that panel, while I was listening to Fami, 438 days in prison, right? So I'm just listening to him on my right. On my left was Jason Rezaian. He spent 544 days in an Iranian prison. And then <laughs> listening to what they went through, I realized I didn't have it so bad after all. You know, not so bad. Um, we can still win this. They got out, but it took a huge toll. And then I asked Fami after the panel ended, I said, you know, how, how'd you get through it? Which, what do you think I should do? You know what he said? Get a mall to represent you. <laughs> He did get Amal as your lawyer. And then we kind of talked about this. And then, you know, I took his advice seriously. And yesterday, we announced our international legal team led by Amal Kuli. <laughs> and Keelan Gallagher, who is leading the legal defense team that is fighting for justice. justice for Daphne Caruana Galicia in Malta, right? Impunity should not happen. And the only way journalists can continue to do their work is if we can stop that. So the lead counsel in Justice for Daphne movement is also with us. And oh man, listening to them, I'm, I'm in awe. They're joined by Chania Gensu, so I'm gonna learn something about Turkey firsthand. Catherine O'Brien, who comes from Melbourne. So the, here's this global team and then they are working with Covington and Berlin councils. Ambassador Dan Feldman, he is somebody I used to chase when he was at the State Department. Um, First Amendment lawyer, Kurt Wimmer, and, and here's how it goes, a classmate from my graduating class. Uh, he's with Covington, and part of the reason the team is working, Peter Lichtenbaum. I call this team the Justice League. And I really do, think they wear capes, you know? And I think that as we sort out, as the journalists are trying to, feel, to, to figure out how we are going to deal with this creative destruction that we're living through, the legal profession also has to do that, right? And I'm surrounded now by these sharp legal minds, and I think that they're creating a new world um, that is going to help journalists. Our, these lawyers are standing up for the rights of, and you'll hear this from Amal Clooney uh, tomorrow when, they, when we open the Global Media Freedom, when she opens it. Um, so it gives me great hope. It gives me great hope, not just for me, but also that what they find, what they create in a legal system um, will help journalists trying to do our jobs. Shine the light. Shine the light. Um, when I woke up this morning, Amal Clooney was trending in the Philippines. It's 4.30 in the morning in, in, in London and trending Amal Clooney. You know, I feel like I have a little flashlight. Um, Amal Clooney has a lighthouse. So, you know, it is a brave new world. We have to embrace it. It is painful. It is destroying an old world order. And, I, you know, I, when I look for solutions, I always look back to post-Holocaust, what did the global community do? Nation states came together. 
econo the economic system, Bretton Woods, NATO, militaries, and you had the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, right? The internet has changed the world as fundamentally as, as World War II did, and I think this is where we're, we need to go. So, as we move forward, investigative journalism is needed. More than ever, it becomes harder to do our jobs, but it's a brave new world. We need to embrace it. We investigate, we expose, and then we build. We're going to have to create the future together, and I'm looking forward to working together to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Maria, for your inspiring words and for ending it on, on such a positive note, uh, despite everything that you have gone through, the intimidation and being imprisoned, and as you say, um, you had to post bail eight times over five weeks. Um, you still remain positive and hopeful, which gives us hope for the future of uh, journalism. Uh, so despite um, Maria ending there on a positive note, 2018 was the worst year on record for journalists. As Mohammed said, something like 80 journalists were killed, 348 uh, in prison, and another 60 are being held hostage. Two journalists here in this room have had to flee their home countries. They're living in self-imposed exile uh, because of the difficulties that they faced reporting from their home countries. So we'd like to call them on stage and find out uh, more about their stories and why 2018 was such a bad year for journalists. If I can please call on stage Taha Siddiqui and Karim Balchi. begin with you because you had a pretty incredible and lucky escape. Just tell us a little bit more about what happened. Uh, well, uh, that was last year uh, in, in uh, January in 2018. I was on my way. I, I, I used to live in Islamabad uh, and I was on my way to the airport uh, and I was traveling to London actually uh, for work. And uh, while uh, on the way, uh, my car was stopped by, my, it was a taxi, and it was stopped by, by two vehicles, one in the front and one in the back. And um, there were these armed men who sort of probably knew me because they, were, they, they called me out with my name uh, and were taking me away. Uh, and during that whole kidnapping attempt, uh, I managed to escape and uh, reach a police station nearby, uh, and this was probably like the event that in that event they took away my my stuff and everything. But this had been ongoing and and uh, since uh, since a few months, uh, and in 2017, uh, basically, I had a case against me under counterterrorism and cybercrime charges uh, by the Federal Investigation Authority for maligning the military, and, and the military would call me uh, many times, and, and officials would call me from the government. So I, I immediately knew that I was the military involved, so I named them as a suspect uh, in the in the police case that I, I filed at the police station. Uh, but later on, I met with the interior minister of Pakistan, at that time it was Asim Iqbal, and he said to me that, uh, you know, I should send in a letter of apology to the army chief, and perhaps he could pardon me. And that's when I decided that it was better that uh, uh, I get out of the country and continue speaking about uh, press freedom. So me and my family with my, my wife and my kid, we decided to come to Paris because I had some journalistic connections there. And so since January, uh, February last year, I've been living in Paris now. Do you feel safe now? Well, uh, in Paris, it's been, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been okay uh, in the sense that uh, it's, it's the, the Pakistan military isn't there in, in physically uh, there. But uh, uh, we, uh, I, I was in the U.S. recently in, in December in Washington, and there I'm, uh, some intelligence agencies approached me and they told me that they had intercepted some communication in which uh, there was a possible assassination plot uh, for me if I return to Pakistan or go to Pakistan-friendly countries. 
So many countries are out of bound for me, but uh, some countries are safe for me. But then in Paris only, like in 2013, uh, three uh, uh, Kurdish dissidents were, were uh, killed uh, by the Turkish regime. So even in exile now, and I've heard friends from in London, friends in, 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 uh, in Europe, uh, in the US have received uh, advisories uh, about the movements, about the travel, and especially after Jamal Khashoggi's uh, uh, assassination in Turkey, uh, that uh, you know authoritarian regimes around the world have gone a little bit more sort of boldened, emboldened by this this act, and uh, might carry out similar sort of acts uh, in the rest of the uh, the world. But uh, I mean, it's it's relatively safer, I would say. Uh, it's not completely or absolutely safe. But then the kind of work we do, it's never safe uh, to be in that kind of work. And Karine, do you uh, feel safe here in London? Because you're living in exile as well. You were driven out of Turkey. And, and the situation for journalists in Turkey has increasingly become grim. In fact, their record is now worse than China's. Unfortunately so. And unfortunately, when I was hearing today the initial speeches, when I heard the numbers, the statistics, they're saying this is a efficiency for the Stalin wrong guy. From now on, we are going to see the place of terrorists. Police is going to take over your buildings. They are going to convert it into pro government media. So we continued on prophecy. I said, Are you a prophet? I'm good. No, he said, I'm Venezuelan. And when you were telling the status of the deterioration of human rights and freedom of expression in Turkey, Definitely, I mean, th in that sense, we've, we're seeing that uh, space for for journalists uh, internationally. I mean, 
you know, in his case, for example, I, I, as you were, we were talking about earlier, uh, I mean, he's here in London for two years now, and his case is, uh, I mean, as far as the political asylum case is concerned, it's stuck, uh, which is, which is, you know, we're in, in that limbo. In me, in in France, I have that sort of limitations of travel. Uh, so once you go into exile, and, and you know, on the other hand, I don't know if you if you sort of experience that back home, but back home in Pakistan or sort of like you know where we come from, they think that exile is some sort of exotic thing that you are born in exile <laughs> and uh, you're living abroad and you have it all and everything. But I mean, the the, the reality is that we're we're in exile because we want to continue talking about the, those issues. And then the the problem of you know uh, with him or with other regimes around. Uh, keeping in touch with our families back home, it's it's becoming problematic. Also, that's one aspect. So, for example, uh, very recently, and I, I haven't spoken, I've, I've just started telling people about this, but very recently, my family in Karachi now has started getting harassed. Uh, uh, my, I mean, my, my, my wife and my kid are with me, but then I have my parents there. And, uh, you know, my mother called me up and said, you know, stop doing what you're doing, uh, whatever you're doing. Uh, it's, and uh, I was like, but I left the country to do that. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a still in exile, uh, still far away from home. Uh, if you want to continue talking about uh, the issue, it's, it's becoming more and more difficult. Uh, and then this is this is from the authoritarian sort of the government side or or, or the way they, they harass the families, but even I mean social media for example, uh, and we're going to come to that. I know you, you wanted to come to that, but just to mention something that happened. Twitter uh, recently started sending out these notices uh, to journalists and activists and academics. Uh, uh, one in in Canada got one, and and one in uh, in Europe, in 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 the UK, and here I got one in Paris, which said that we were violating Pakistani laws uh, by tweeting certain things. Uh, so now Twitter is is and these social media platforms, Facebook already heavily collaborates with regimes like Pakistan, or I'm sure in Turkey also, or these other. So so now social media was one of the places where we were supposed to have this voice or keep connection, this connection or continue talking. My website, safenewsrooms.org, which I launched, which documents censorship, was banned in four weeks in Pakistan. Now I have a mirroring uh, with Reporters Without Borders, but I mean. So it's a constant struggle, and you know, while we have to worry about our safety, while we have to worry about our sort of, you know, uh, uh, making a living, uh, learning a new language in my case because I'm in France, uh, and uh, you know, all of these things. Uh, and, 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 and the troll army did come after you as well once you started talking about the fact that there was this attempted kidnapping. I remember seeing on Twitter and Facebook, you know, that that you fabricated the whole thing and. How did you have 12 men who'd approached you and booted you up? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, uh, they, 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 they came out with songs and they came out with, with, uh, with cartoons. I mean, they have a lot of resources at this. Uh, and they have, uh, they have these social media cells uh, which run hashtags. Or just very recently, one of the top trends in Pakistan that trended for like a whole day was uh, something which was hashtag anti uh, arrest anti-Pakistan journalists. Uh, and uh, then three social media uh, uh, profiles of three uh, very prominent journalists have been just de deactivated very recently because now they're trying to, uh, uh, to, to control the social media debate. Then, of course, the troll armies. And the troll armies are not just, you know, I mean, most of these accounts are, are, are basically accounts which you can see, you can go and see. They usually have a Pakistan uh, army uh, sort of uh, you know emblem or, or a flag saying we love so they're very blatant about it they're very open about it and 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 then they attack and and uh, create these yeah I mean there's also not just that I mean if you go into this whole fake news I uh, sort of you know attacks that we get there's a website that in Pakistan that runs which with a name something called Sydney Express dot co dot UK or something like that, which publishes these articles about, you know, with the state narrative, and then also publishes news stories about Australia or other, or, and just plagiarizes that to make it look, so it's a very sort of uh, concerted sort of like uh, uh, creative effort uh, in silencing and drowning our voices through these trolls and through these uh, websites and, and then uh, different kinds of controls. Yeah. I remember that this, this troll issue, I think, started before the coup attempt of 2016, and I was already a victim. Then uh, I studied in Israel. I did my MA in the University of Sydney. I speak Arabic also. Uh, but speaking, as I mentioned, uh, speaking Hebrew makes you already the yeah, what's that? So uh, a similar website uh, made stories about my uh, Kurdish ancestors. If I was, I wouldn't have any problem with 
really was amazing. So uh, they claimed that back in 1970s, uh, the husband of my late mother passed away, and Mossad came and replaced him at <laughs> the and that, uh, and I am the son of that Jew, and uh, for 45 years I kept the secrecy and so on, <laughs> just to become a journalist, you know. <laughs> um, but the story all went on, and, it, and, and unfortunately, this story found its way into my indictment. Mm. Now, a prosecutor, that is a university graduate, wow. okay, took the story and said that there are, you know, Credible reports in Turkish media that claims this guy is a Mossad agent, is actually placed into a Muslim family, behaving as a, you know secret, uh, as if a, as a Muslim, in order to infiltrate into state apparatus and so on. So such stories continue on being created on the night of the Kuwait. I was here in London, thanks to that American Venezuelan guy. I was here in London. I'm not an expert on Turkish politics. I never comment on Turkish political issues. I'm an expert on political Islam, terrorism, and so on. The day before, there was a terrorist attack in Nice, in France. And it was the very first terrorist attack that was perpetrated without a gun or any bomb. It was a truck, you know, fire trucks. And I was worried, very worried that it was, it was going to be new modus operandi of terrorism in, in Western capitals. And it happened here in the United Kingdom twice. So I was invited to comment on this on a YouTube channel. And I started speaking about it, but suddenly news started to come in from Turkey, military in the streets, and so on. I found myself in a position to comment. So the speaker asked me what I suggest, you know, to the Turkish people to do. And I said, I'm not a Turkish army. They will kill. But if you don't know how to fight, you aren't. People don't go to the streets. You need to be you know, trained people. And I knew already that the Turkish police was not a part of the military. So I leave it to the Turkish police. We have more police in Istanbul than the army. Half an hour later, Turkish prisoners spoke to the media. And he invited people to, see, to the streets to clash with the army. And I still believe. And that night I also said, whoever is killed, the president is responsible for their killing. Because he invited people to clash with the army, which was actually a part of the uh, 254 people were killed uh, for nothing. The coup was already a failure. And they had, I, 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 I'm still against any kind of coup, despite the fact that the situation deteriorated back in Turkey. But, I was very furious, and I said, I think this president has lost his mind. He's telling people to go and fight with the armed army. Uh, and the prosecutor said that I was actually trying to discourage people from going to the streets and clashing with the army, that I was actually involved in the altogether masterminding of the Kuwait and so on. And he asked three consecutive life terms for me plus 15 years of bonus. And I always joke, if it was not for the 15 years bonus, it would be OK. <laughs> <laughs> the point is this. For about, I think, two months, I became the most hated man in Turkey, just because of the campaign. And so on. Because they didn't have any, any journalist or civilian that was criticizing the president. The and, and this is where you see in Turkey how social media has been weaponized as well, where, mm -hmm. where these troll armies come out and, and attack you. And as Maria said, something local becomes international. Well, the, the term Maria used, you know, this, the, the, the network of disinformation is actually a paid network of disinformation. And it is paid by public money. That is the worrying side of it. The government has that sole arm. They are paid because of the job they are doing. And well, we cannot cope with 8,000 paid. And I mean, in, in Pakistan, I don't know if that's the case in Turkey, but in Pakistan, they're now uh, hiring interns from universities. So students from universities around the country uh, get internship with the military media wing, uh, where they are trained uh, in how to use social media and then run hashtag trends. And I met some students at a university lecture that I went to, 
and then I found out investigating that it's it's basically so yeah I mean uh, it's 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 the so they're they're sort of like you know getting two sort of uh, benefits out of one thing that they're brainwashing the youth uh, by bringing them in and then also using them against as a, uh, on as a weaponized social media tools and and it can be quite sophisticated as well. Yes, definitely. I mean, uh, in that sense, uh, uh, you know, like the hashtag trends, uh, uh, they've been able to manage that. The Facebook accounts have been managed. But I mean, again, like all, in all of this, I feel that uh, we need to also bring the debate back to the fact that social media platforms themselves, uh, they are sort of being a problem in, in, uh, in uh, they're, they're not, you know, I mean, for example, uh, trends like uh, arrest anti-Pakistan journalists, Top trended on Twitter for the whole day in Pakistan. Uh, journalists were, were 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 called. There's this term that they use in Pakistan and India, like which is prostitutes for, from a prostitute prostitute. So that that trended on Twitter. Uh, Facebook has a lot of these hate pages and hate campaigns that are running. And at the end of the day, what we do, what we see is that Twitter is sending out notices to people like me or other journalists like us. Uh, Facebook is taking off accounts which are which are progressive, which are talking about sexual rights, which minority religious minority rights, uh, uh, and and sort of like collaborating with the state. So, I mean, while there's the social media trolls, uh, what are the social media companies doing is a bigger question, I think. Indeed, I mean, we know that in Turkey in the last 15 years, things have become increasingly difficult for journalists, and then especially post 2016 coup and in the last four years. But can you tell us the turning point in Pakistan? Where, I mean, just in the last week, we know that three news channels have gone off air. As you say, social media accounts of prominent journalists have been shut down. What was the turning point for Pakistan? Well, I think it was, uh, I mean, uh, 2011, uh, when, when Salim Shahzad, there was a Pakistani journalist who was kidnapped uh, from, uh, so uh, he was going to a TV show and in a similar sort of kidnapping that I went through, he was kidnapped, taken away, and two days later, his body was found tortured uh, and dumped uh, on the on, on a nearby town from Islamabad. Uh, and then later on, there was a big commission investigation commission that was set up. Human Rights Watch came out with emails which showed that the intelligence agencies were involved in it, were threatening him. There were emails of them. And despite that, nothing happened. Uh, and that sort of like gave them the impunity, sort of like, you know, that we could get away with killing a journalist in broad daylight in Islamabad. Then uh, that was, he was working with international media, so that was a different thing that sent out a message to the international media. Then in 2014, and this is also a very internationally well-known case that was uh, recorded, was with Hamid Mir, a Pakistani journalist who was shot uh, at least six times, if I'm not wrong, while coming out of the airport uh, and going to his uh, headquarters in Karachi. And he survived that, and he also named the, uh, the intelligence agencies, the chief of intelligence, and despite that, the channel that he was working for uh, shut down under blasphemy accusations, completely unrelated accusations. Uh, and that sort of, and the media, rest of the media industry did not sort of support them. And that kind of showed that there were divisions and, and, and if you could get away by uh, shooting someone like that, then basically the result today that in Pakistan, what, ex what exists is that there's around about 88% of journalists self-censor. Uh, so, so there's a lot of self-censorship, uh, and and the, and the problem is recently an editor uh, of Dawn newspaper, which is the the leading and the the biggest newspaper in Pakistan, he said that you know earlier they were trying to kill journalists, and now they're trying to kill journalism, and that's where the level has come in Pakistan, uh, where we're completely uh, strangulating the the the, uh, the independent press and free press, and it's coming down to the level where they want to have just a PR agency. Uh, which becomes uh, uh, reporters become stenographers. They they just report what as it is, uh, and nothing beyond that. Uh, so so it's 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 been gradual, but the la I think the last six seven years uh, we've seen since 2011. Uh, and mind you, I mean at the same time since 9/11, and as as earlier on da Daniel Pearl's uh, sort of uh, sister spoke here, and that happened in 2002, right after 9/11. And since 9/11, over 100 100 journalists have been killed in Pakistan. And not a single case except for two cases in which one of them, there has been a sort of a, a prosecution that went ahead, but still the guy has not been punished. And the other one they found out, but they haven't been arrested. 
and the rest, over 100 cases, are still unresolved, unsolved, and no, no move or, or there's, there's nothing going forward even in those cases. And, and part of the issue, I suppose, is, is that despite these cases and despite some of them reaching the international community, nothing is being done about it and therefore there is this feeling that you can get away with it. Well, the issue is that you, we have heard the term impunity talk the whole time. So I mean, we're referring largely to impunity within a jurisdiction. So a Pakistani journalist killed by some other Pakistanis or in, in, intelligence agency and not paid the price. So there is an impunity issue in international order. Countries learn from each other. You know, authoritarian countries observe what the other authoritarian countries can do and go on without paying the price. If the President of the United States refer to the major newspapers of the country as enemy of the people and go away with it, uh, don't pay any price for it, then obviously the Pakistani or Turkish or any other, you know... Because uh, in the Asian United country. States it's rhetoric, but in some of these other countries it's not. Well, the point is this, in my country, they refer to when my newspaper was raided by uh, the police and the web, our website, all our history was erased in one night. We don't have history. We are erased from history. In I'm not a journalist only, I'm, a, I'm an academic also. I published articles in the official Encyclopedia of Islam, in this is the Turkish one, and they are erased from the uh, encyclopedia. And MA uh, thesis, PhD thesis written by our journalist friends are erased from the database of higher education mm -hmm. constructs. So we are simply <coughs> erased from history. Why? Because they see that these go uh, with impunity and they were showing, they were showing actually uh, films of British police entering into uh, a British media and destroying CDs. I don't know if you remember the wiretapping issue and so on. So yeah, whatever yeah. is happening here the news is the used by the authoritarian regimes as the legitimacy or pretext of doing worse things in their own countries. And they always say, well, they do it in the West. When Turkey declared the state of emergency after the coup, uh, and it was not only a state of emergency, it was a state of authoritarian rule par excellence in Turkey, they always refer to the French mm. state of emergency, which was nothing to be compared mm. to what was happening in Turkey, but they do that. So the impunity in the West turns back to us and we, the journalists, can pay I, the price. We've just got a, a couple more minutes on, on this panel, but can I just ask quickly a, a question about Jamal Khashoggi? Because Turkey was very vocal when it came uh, to Jamal Khashoggi's case, calling on the Saudis to uh, you know, uh, answer the questions about his case and what happened to him. So what do you make of, of Turkey's hypocrisy? Well, when this question is asked to Turkish politicians and they say, you know, okay, you are doing a championship of, uh, of, of a particular issue, but you also are the largest imprisoner of journalists in, in your country. Just, oh, they're not journalists. And the Turkish president shamefully says, None of them has a press conference. Well, they first canceled the press conference. <laughs> In the last three years, 1,954 press cards are canceled. Well, they are always given by the state uh, organs that are controlled by previously prime minister, now by presidency. I never applied for that because I believe a press card that is given by a government organ is not a press card. It has to be given by an independent organization, which we lack in my country. But anyhow, if I was in Turkey, and if I was, I was jailed, and, and you already know what was going to be my sentence, three consecutive lifetimes, and the 15 years of joyful bonus after it. And they would say, no, he's, he's a terrorist. He's a terrorist. And, and the spy of Israel, is, and does he have a press card? No. So we do have, as of uh, today, official number uh, by the three uh, journalists initiated is 154 journalists, not media workers. The number of media workers is much higher. Uh, organizations like RSF, 
you know, a journalist who were working for state organs as journalists, like if you were working for the official Turkish TV channel, TRT, which has 34 journalists behind the bars, you're not counted as journalists. I don't understand that, but in the end, the number is much higher than that, but none of them count as journalists in Turkey. Uh, on that note, uh, we'll have to wrap up this panel, but uh, given 2018 is the worst year on record for journalists, we're very privileged that you both continue to write and work and get uh, the uh, truth uh, out there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ressa. Uh, I'd now like to call her back to the stage um, for our, our special interview um, and to learn a little bit more about her case and uh, what's happening in the Philippines as well across uh, the region. Maria, thank you so much for your inspiring words uh, earlier. You spoke about the fact that Amar Clooney is now representing you. So if you can just tell us a little bit more about your legal situation and where it stands. Uh, I have eight ongoing cases now. There are weeks where I will go to court four times on many different cases. I probably spend 70 to 80 percent of my time dealing with this, um, not, not including, you know, this is a war of attrition. It's a attrition of your attention, attrition of resources. Um, but I always have to give you the good side. Um, we were forced, as, because the, the cases began in January 2018, we were forced to pivot our business model by April of 2018 because our advertising revenue dropped 49%. You can't fight. The government has its resources and people are afraid. And so we were forced to find a sustainable business model using technology and data. We've found it. I think it kind of gave us a head start because the advertising model is kind of dead. <laughs> you, you, you spoke in your keynote, you said, why is questioning becoming criminal? What do you think it is about these regimes that they fear the pen, what, the work that you do? What is it uh, that they fear most? It's extreme arrogance and impunity. You know, it, and, I, and I'll go back to technology, and it was interesting to listen to your last panel, because that word prostitutes, you know, that started in the United States, spread to India, Pakistan, the Philippines. It was picked up by our propaganda machine, spread to South Africa. It was used to denigrate us. These attacks are systematic. They attack journalists. They attack institutions that, so that your credibility, that, so that you don't know what to believe. It's very Russian disinformation. Is, that's the basis of it, right? If you don't know whom to believe and you don't know what to believe, then you can be reshaped. Your value system can be reshaped. I think that's what we're seeing. So this, the role of technology is huge in this. Um, and how do we fight it? We fight it as journalists, you know, investigative journalism that, frankly, is thinking slow, right? But social media is thinking fast. The manipulation are you know, lies wrapped in anger and hate and they spread much faster. So we're really in an uphill battle right now, and we need the tech platform's help because they've got to, they've got to become gatekeepers because the public sphere is diseased. It really is, and it works against journalists. And I think a point that was made in the earlier panel when the leader of the free world describes journalists as enemies of the people. I mean, we've got President Duterte describing jour journalists as spies and, and sons of bitches. And this kind of rhetoric has become the norm. It's the dictator's playbook. I'm, I'm sorry, you know, it's the same thing. When you, when you can astroturf, and I use this, that phrase in the same way that you did in the panel earlier, astroturf is uh, putting fake grass so that you can create this bandwagon effect and make people think that this is true when in reality, it isn't, but you've already been shaped, right? So that's part of it. That softens. It's like fertilizer for the, for the budding populist authoritarian leader 
to come in and then use the podium of power, use state resources to actually come and cement power. That's what we're seeing. And we need to actively fight it. We need to do more stories about it. It is, in our end, it was investigative journalism that gave us the data to be able to fight. It's, the reason I say it with certainty is I can show you the data. I can show you the social networks, just like we can look at Al Qaeda networks. You know, you can see it. And we can do this country to country and connect it to the global disinformation system. In the Philippines, we were able to look at our social media landscape and connect see the connections to the alt-right in Canada, the alt-right in the US, and the IRA, the Internet Research Agency, the Russian disinformation. This is geopolitical power. And yes, it is paid. It's power meant to manipulate for more power. You have, as you say, uh, been in journalism for more A long than time. <laughs> three decades. You've also known President Duterte for almost three decades. I mean, the first time you interviewed him was in 1986. He's very much aware of your work and the kind of work that you actually highlighted the, uh, the issues that the country, his region, Davao, faced under him. Why do you think he's trying to make an example of you today? Violence and fear uh, is a tool in the toolbox of President Duterte because when you have this vile, the drug war, this very brutal drug war, and then when he runs after enemies, and you don't need the facts, right? He'll come out with a list, list, narco list, list of politicians who are involved in drugs, and then they wind up dying um, when uh, perceived enemies have cases against them. It's a, it stifles dissent. And again, is there that much to hide that you can't answer questions, that you are violating the Constitution, that this is blatant abuse of power? It's, you know, I, I think if you're not fighting for your democracy now, you must, because we will only get weaker with time. Uh, and so, yeah, President Duterte, I think I, it, when I interviewed him in October 2015, um, this is when he was getting ready to campaign, and I asked him, he, he, when we started, he said, you know, he reminded me of our last interview. And I was still with CNN when I did that. And it wasn't a flattering interview, but he can be charming. Authentic is the word that we always use. And he admitted to killing three people. I asked him the questions a journalist would ask. And I have to say he was refreshing because he just said what came to his mind. And that's the same thing that you're seeing now. So what are we but seeing? But is that what? Um, draws people to leaders like him because they, they, as you say, there's something refreshing about the fact that he will admit to certain things. And when you question him, he does answer you in, in as much yeah, of the truth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I think this is a perfect storm, right? Because democracy hasn't, liberal democracy hasn't brought all of the trickle down effect hasn't trickled down enough. And you put that together with kind of the accelerant of technology with the 99%. We've been in the US, it started with the 99% a few years ago. And if you look at the push forward towards more authoritarian style populist leaders, I'd say it began really moving in 2014, India and Modi, Indonesia in 2014, Prabowo, the former son-in-law of President Suharto, almost won, right? He ran again this time um, in a, in a more complex world, we want the world to be simpler. And believing somebody who seems to be just like you, which is what the presidential spokesman will always say, like having a beer with him, you know? Um, there's part of us that wants that. So I understand it, but what I don't understand is why people who are educated, who do better, business can be co-opted, right? Because you get deals easier. Corruption is more centralized. Um, why they stay quiet? When I was growing up in the U.S., when I when I was growing up in the U.S. and I went back to the Philippines after 1986, the people power revolt. Our country created that term, people power. And I thought, um, how could a man like Ferdinand Marcos have been in power for 21 years? Isn't the society co-opted as well? Didn't we help that? And then my friend said, you know, 
it's because you don't live here. It's because you're elitist. And then I would say, well, yeah, okay, I'm an intellectual elitist, and I'm okay with that. I like to think. Why, why shouldn't we be thinking? Long answer to this plays to the worst of human nature. In the same way that the violence post in World War II that led to that was also the worst of human nature. We're seeing resurgence of it, but this one is led by the internet. And we need to come out with a system of values. And it is a combination of pushing the social media platforms and tech people that because they don't understand and they, they're going to be forced to understand. And then the medium term is media literacy. The long term is education. But we can't wait for the long term because if we do, I always say this in academic, when we're, when we're all talking about this and the academics will say, yes, but we need to study this. I'm like, guys, please remember, I could be in jail by the time you like <laughs> study this. So please act. Like, and this is where I think smaller, agile, large news groups, we need to actually keep experimenting because there is no solution. I've, we work with the social media platforms. They don't really know how to do it, and their business imperatives don't lead, give them an easy path. I mean, over the last uh, 30 years, you've observed uh, the, the kind of journalism that the Philippines has done and the region. And we often talk about the pendulum shifting. I mean, you, you've, you've seen, uh, you talked about the people's power in 1986. I mean, where is the Philippines and the region today in terms of press freedom? I began my career as a journalist in 1986. How exhilarating is that, right? And then uh, I worked I, for a decade in Manila covering Southeast Asia, and I covered every single nation that moved from authoritarian one-man rule to democracy. And I would hate that at the tail end of my career, I would be covering the pendulum swinging back with a different trigger. Uh, I believe we're on the right side of history. We know what the values are. It's a tougher one. It requires that we believe in the goodness of people, right? And that we hold those who want to take advantage of that to account. That's why we became journalists in the first place. But when someone like you, with your experience and your platform, is intimidated and spending so much time trying to post bail, what hope is there, I mean, for the future of journalism? Which is why I'm not intimidated. You know, I've... I've I'll say this, what the heck, right? I mean, my family wants me to stay in the US. I'm a dual citizen. Um, I thought it was interesting, even on our panel in New York. The I imagine us, Duterte wants you to stay in the US as well. I think he likes a challenge. No. <laughs> um, no, but the reason why I keep going back, number one, I have an amazing team. And the younger generation, we're building our next generation of reporters. They're extremely courageous. and. I don't even call it courage. I, it just is. This is now, it's like there's pollution in the air, and that's what they're breathing, and they're going at it. But the other side is threats alone shouldn't stop us. It needs to have a name. You act on it, here's the name, and we hold it to account. And whether we can hold these violations and abuses of power to account next year, or three years from now, or a decade from now, there will be names attached to these actions. We've seen this in history before, so I, I demand that in the Philippines. I'll say one last thing before I forget this one, which is in Pakistan. Push Facebook, because they really are doing something. Like in Pakistan, for example, the last takedown, they named the ISI. That's pretty incredible. In the Philippines, they've done three takedowns. And in the last takedown last March, they named the network uh, and they took down the personal account of the guy who was the social media campaign manager of President Duterte, right? Uh, I think we need to push, and we need to let the tech people understand what is exactly at stake. It is our lives on the line, but we don't really have a choice. I don't have a choice. <laughs> you talked uh, in your keynote about liberal international order these institutions that were formed. But these are the institutions then that we're seeing these sorts Falter. of numbers. Yeah. yeah, You know, 80 journalists killed, 348 in prison. Because the world has already changed drastically and we are using old tools to deal with new problems. Again, you go back to thinking fast, thinking slowly. If you haven't read the book, you should. It's Because it's all of this stuff plays to the worst of us, the worst of humanity, right? When you hear President Duterte curse, 
He is sexist at best, misogynistic at worst. And what we're seeing, what I'm worried about, is that there's a whole new generation of young men and women who will, we are rolling back our values. This has an impact on our values. Um, so, and to hear Filipinos say, it's okay to kill. It's okay to kill, you see that on Facebook. But how much is real and how much is fake? We don't know that. And more people need to find the courage to speak. And the people who are privileged in each of our societies have far more, uh, uh, they should be speaking more. This is not the time to duck. I mean, Mohammed uh, said in his earlier speech that the hostility towards journalists should not become the norm, but it already has. It is. I mean, and because it's so easy, just like in, you know, in World War II, it was um, now instead of being a journalist, I've been a journalist my whole life and I work so hard at doing a good job at it, but it doesn't matter because the propaganda machine exponentially says criminal. My government calls me a criminal. The, the spokesman for President Duterte says that, and I will challenge that. That's an abuse of power. But where do we go, right? Who do we go to for a sense of justice? That's why we were journalists in the first place. We look for a sense of justice. I don't have all the answers, but I think we need to come together and we need to truly, uh, this is why I'm in London. Canada and Britain coming together, okay guys, that's great because how many governments have been silent while all of this is happening? Um, so I'm hoping good things will come out of it. I know you could be cynical, but let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> In, in fact, uh, as you say, uh, Rappler's going into partnership with the investigative journal now. Fun. <laughs> yes. And, and uh, you know, is that something that you feel uh, President Duterte will find even more irritating, that you're, you're uh, increasing your, your global reach? I think even as we are fighting a defensive battle, we need to continue building for the future. And that's really, my friends ask me, why am I optimistic? Because this time is really... Like, I think we can create amazing things. I wish my government would stop and let me create, right? But even if they don't, we will still create and we will partner. It is a global landscape. Here's the flip side of all of the disinformation networks on Facebook. Humanity has never been connected by one platform in the way we are today. So the negative part is prostitutes can travel like that to any country around the world. But the positive part is these vertical silos of nation states are effectively gone. If they can fix the algorithms, we can use this for good. I'm positive. So you're, so you're hopeful about the state of journalism, especially, especially investigative journalism? I think investigative journalism is more important now than ever because fear and then this kind of impunity is, is pushing forward. I, I call it this dictator's playbook. We see it. And you know the guys, they really like each other. I was there in APEC when Trump, Duterte, Putin, in ASEAN, they like each other. And I can only like, think about what they whisper about. You know, that pesky journalist. And they do, right? Remember Putin and Trump. So how do, what do we do? How do we react? Do we just like say, hey, this is horrible? We have to, here's the last part. How do you use technology to build communities? How do you use, this is this, the elevator pitch of Rappler in 2012 was, we build communities of action. And the journalism is what we feed our communities. I think that's a great problem and we can solve that problem. Maria Ressa, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we're just going to do, do a quick setup on, on the stage because we've got one final uh, panel. Uh, joining us here on the stage is uh, Mohammed Fami to tell us more about uh, the investigative journal and Sarah Clark from Article 19 to talk about the role of civil society.
But we've had um, some extraordinary speakers here uh, yeah. this afternoon, uh, this evening, rather. And, of course, Maria spoke about this uh, two-day conference between yes. the UK and Canadian governments about press freedom. Just tell us about the importance of that. Why is that so important right now, given, given these numbers that we've seen in, in terms of the numbers of journalists killed and imprisoned? Well, like uh, Maria said, uh, the Canadian and the British government are starting this incredibly timely conference because of these statistics that we're hearing that, um, you know, as I said, they can't be normalized and it's time for solutions. You know, we've, we've seen the numbers, we know what's happening. This congregation tomorrow uh, is about what can we do about it? And, you know, in during my imprisonment, I have come to really appreciate what NGOs do. Those um, civil society uh, armies out there that are working around the clock, um, it all made sense to me. Now that I'm in prison and I realize that I need the hashtags, I need the protests, I need the vigils, legislation and issues that I never thought about as a journalist um, are now my lifeline, basically. So I look forward to this uh, conference because the, um, there are, you know, ministers and uh, lawmakers and policymakers all coming under one uh, roof. Um, and I myself have been working uh, in the advocacy world after my uh, release from prison. I founded a small foundation in uh, Canada, Vancouver, um, and we do what you do for decades now. <laughs> I mean, we've spoken a lot about the negative impact of social media, but actually, as you say, for you, it was a positive thing. Those hashtags, mm. journalism is not a crime. Yeah. You know, I remember that very of clearly. Course. And we all were part of it to of try course. and push for your release from that Egyptian prison. Yeah, it's, I know I, uh, I used to get some little bit of information through the grapevine of the prison, even solitary confinement, you hear. So you news. were aware of what I was happened? aware, and I was, it, it, it saved my life. Um, so everybody in this room, there is something you can do for somebody who is an ocean away by plugging into the hashtag. And you know, editors in the newspapers and TV channels, they, they always want something new. They want, um, you know, they want to report a new angle to the story. And by engaging with these internet uh, activities, you are contributing if you do believe in a specific cause. We would talk about these institutions, and we've spoke, spoken to uh, Maria about that, um, these institutions that are supposed to protect journalists. But this latest report, I mean, it is quite disheartening when you see these numbers and the fact that these institutions are not there actually to protect journalists, even though they were formed to do those sorts of things. Yeah, so I, I, we see at the international level that there has been a real weakening in, in political will. Uh, to address issues around killings of journalists, um, attacks on journalists, uh, extremely uh, egregious legislation, um, anti-terror legislation, defamation uh, laws which are used globally to detain journalists. Um, and so we've, we're also extremely concerned by this uh, rise of, of anti-journalist rhetoric, in particular by heads of state and, and high-level politicians. Uh, and that's that's not just in in the Philippines and in 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 Egypt, but it's 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 across Europe. Um, I recently returned from the from the Balkans. I was in Albania and Serbia, uh, where you see political leaders at the highest levels referring constantly to journalists as trash, uh, as enemies of the state, as treasonous. Um, and what we know is that all of these. Uh, these challenges lay the way for for the killings of journalists. So it's both the, the legal framework, um, it's the threats, mm -hmm. it's the attacks. Um, we mentioned earlier the case of Daphne Caruana Galizia in, in Malta. Um, and what's most alarming about that mm -hmm. is that it happened in Malta, in yeah. Europe, in in a, a continent where you know we often uh, hear about the politicians preaching about yeah. press freedom and the protection of journalists. So the cases of Daphne Caruana Galizia in, in Malta and Jan Kuciak in Slovakia, um, both assassinated uh, in direct retaliation for their work exposing corruption and organized crimes at the highest level of government, um, have really brought home the issue of, of the safety of journalists and, and, and issues around impunity. So. 
the ongoing impunity, total impunity, for the killing of, of ethnic Arawanic Elysia is a particular um, cause of concern uh, within the EU, at least in Slovakia. We have seen um, the arrests uh, both of, of the alleged uh, hitmen and, and mastermind. Um, but in Malta, we've seen, we've seen total impunity and we've seen a complete lack of political will by the Maltese authorities uh, to investigate and bring the masterminds of, of, of that killing to justice. And I think what we really risk in all of this is, is that the EU, the Council of Europe, um, European nations um, really risk becoming complicit in their silence um, for not drawing enough attention, for not calling out Malta, um, Saudi Arabia uh, for these killings. We see Saudi Arabia awarded the G20. Um, Malta, a Commonwealth country and a member of the European Union, uh, is, is really being allowed to continue as if nothing has happened. They are quite literally getting away with murder in that case. So our role as civil society, and, and I know some of my colleagues here in, in uh, tonight who we work very in a very focused way on these individual cases. Um, so in Malta, in, 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 in the Khashoggi case, um, we've been working to, uh, to bring these cases uh, to international attention, to work with the lawyers in these cases, and to call, in the case of Malta, for an immediate public inquiry, not just into her assassination, but also into the circumstances that allowed for this to happen. Um, and to ensure that lessons are learned. Because if you think of the consequence of impunity in these cases, it is an enormous chilling effect on journalists in those countries. Um, and you have the whole society deprived of not just that, the voice of that journalist, but of their work and of all of the investigations in the public interest. Now, what's particularly worrying about this moment, um, even with this conference, is that we've seen a real breakdown in the international order at the Human Rights Council, at the UN. Um, we have seen amazing um, investigations by the UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Killings in the case of Jamal Khashoggi uh, and of Peter Omzik, who is the specially designated Special Rapporteur of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe into the assassination of Daphne Caruana Galicia. Both of those um, those individuals published reports in the last month um, which showed the degree of state complicity um, in these assassinations. So it's not that we're without the information, but what we're without is, is the, the pressure. pressure. Because that pressure actually mm -hmm. worked on Egypt to some extent. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, there was a lot of pressure on, on Egypt. Um, you didn't become just a statistic. No. No, oh, yeah, so you, you, you worry in that cell that you are going to be just a statistic. And you, my advice when I meet uh, people who, have, who are still going through the situation is you, you need to work in a parallel strategy. So you have the game-changing lawyer, like this Amal Clooney, who is going to bring in um, an extensive, uh, you know, uh, experience in dealing with diplomats from all over the place because you have to um, you know, use everything you, you got. You're walking on eggshells. Every decision makes a difference. It could worsen your situation. You end up staying in longer, or it could, you, you could get your break. So it's important that you know, uh, countries use sanctions mm -hmm. as one tool, and I'm sure this has been brought to the table with many of the cases that you go through. Um, you have the information. You've done the research. You have the proof, but then you know, these countries need to know that they, um, you know, could suffer if they continue to do that and imprison journalists and human rights activists and people who are innocent. That's one way to go uh, with the sanctions, but also the role of civil society and the families and the people who, in my case, um, were basically a lifeline. And, and, and what happened in Egypt um, became a passport for me. As a journalist, it's it's really hard, and it's this thin line between activism and uh, journalism uh, could get you in trouble sometimes. And you know, so it, it is complicated. But when you're in that cell, it's not an exclusive anymore. It's mm -hmm. not a story. You're just trying. It's 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 getting out of that cell. Um, and again, without the help of everybody who really cares about 
democracy and fundamentals of uh, democracy, press, press freedom, and freedom of expression, I would not be sitting here today. You, you talked about uh, that moment and that experience changing your life. I and mean, what lessons have you learned from it? Well, I learned and I, in, during my um, lectures that I give at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, uh, where I've um, been um, a professor there for a, a period of time, the students always come up to me and say, what channel should I watch? Um, I want to be out there on the, in Syria. I go, you know, there is no story that's worth dying for. Yes, we do the journalism, and, but you need to uh, be sure to protect yourself. And that's what, why we're all here today, because um, the governments and the networks need to abide by the changing atmosphere on the ground. In the past, journalists would wear the, the press and assume that nobody's going to fire at them. Today, increasingly, and probably worse, it's the worst in a generation where you are targeted by both extremist groups, governments, and everybody hates the journalist. It's just incredibly um, you know, tough out there. Uh, and I tell the students, you can still report a good story um, from downtown, you know, but you, know, you just need to understand that when professional CNN or BBC reporters go out there um, and you see them on the screen, they have an almost a small army of people behind them that's telling them when to leave the area. They've studied how to exit, how to um, survive to file the story, basically. But, but increasingly, I mean, you don't have to go to a war zone to be targeted and killed. So these people being targeted and killed yeah. Yeah. Uh, in their own community, right. reporting on stories yeah. downtown. Yeah. 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 And I, and I think, you know, when you look at the, the journalists who have been killed, the, the most dangerous beats are covering corruption and human rights abuses. And what we've seen in Europe and, and Central Asia, which is, which is the region that I focus on, is, you know, the, the targeted um, attacks on, on journalists, especially who are reporting on high levels of corruption, both in government um, and in organized crime, and in, in many countries there's no distinction between organized crime and government, so you know, this, this, the, the level of pressure on those journalists is higher than ever, mainly because the very institutions which are designed to protect them have now been hollowed out. It's not, it's not that those institutions have been, um, have been removed, they still are there, in, 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 often in a shell form, um, as we see this sort of state capture in, in so many countries across across the region. Including the United States and Including, the UK here yeah. have dropped in the index. In, in the index. And, and so we see, you know, major concerns around separation of powers, around the independence of the judiciary, around the independence of the police. Um, when you look at, at these individual cases, you know, you, you see that the assassination of, of journalists really goes, it goes to the heart of of the breakdown of, of democratic institutions and the separation of powers. So in these investigations, you see how very clearly um, the, the, the need to in, the, the need for justice and, and the search for justice really, it turns on those institutions. And so what we've had to do now in, in many cases is we're, we're looking you know, directly to other governments uh, to use their pressure, as they did in, in Egypt, mm -hmm. but when it comes to Saudi Arabia, to Malta, and, and, and to other um, other states where we have impunity, we need to see much stronger political will um, by those governments um, like the UK who who want to be the champions of press freedom. And so, what we hope from this conference, you know, there's some very there are some very easy wins. You know, we, there are many. There's there's a, a pledge the governments are. Are being asked to sign up to, and um, and that's very important. Um, but what we're asking from civil society's perspective is, you know, there's some very easy things that these governments can do. One is to release journalists. We've got mm -hmm. over 350 journalists in prison. And not everyone has a, a Mark Clooney. Representative. Not everyone has them, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> and and you know that's one very quick and simple solution. But 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 we are asking. And for all governments. But I mean, the pushback from countries like Turkey is mm -hmm. these are spies, these are, these these are not terrorists. journalists, these are terrorists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we can debunk all of those uh, claims. I mean, it's so, the situation in Turkey is so well documented. Um, I've sat in many of these trials in, in Turkey where, 
you have essentially a show trial that is extremely well documented uh, by international lawyers, by international civil society. Um, these are absolutely absurd and fictitious um, and, and grotesque miscarriages of law and the weaponization of the judiciary against, against journalists. So yes, while Turkey at present will not accept that these are journalists, the entire body of evidence and the right side of history is that these, of course these are journalists. Um, and we might need much stronger pressure from the UK, from the EU, from the US, um, on Turkey at this moment to ensure that those those journalists are released. Mohammed, tell us a little bit more about the investigative journal and what it hopes to achieve, because it, uh, as Marie was saying, it's run in partnership with Rafa mm -hmm. now. Well, um, just in the past uh, couple of months, we went from producing uh, uh, articles about uh, terrorism uh, in the beginning, now we're diversifying. Yeah. Uh, we're publishing all sorts of topics uh, and hoping to uh, establish more partnerships. Uh, the Rappler partnership is definitely um, uh, one that I'm looking forward to uh, in, in terms of execution because of what Maria said. Um, the more, um, you know, sort of uh, having a coalition where you are uh, plugged into demographics and various geographical areas, the more access you can get. Um, but I'd like to take this opportunity as well to announce that we are uh, beginning a, uh, to film in New York first, um, a weekly um, interview uh, show. Um, we have, uh, we'll be working with an American uh, anchor um, and we are basically going to bring together experts to be interviewed on topics that we have written about, to expand on them, um, or just um, you know tackle topics that are dominating on news, but we'll take it a step further. So you know we're beginning with the issue of the Venezuelans, uh, the exodus uh, in South America that hasn't uh, been like that for a generation, uh, with all these um, um, refugees stuck on the Colombian border. And again, it's not just an issue with the UN being depleted. The UN is depleted in terms of uh, its assistance for refugees, um, with what's happening in Syria specifically. But uh, yeah, so we are expanding into video. We, we, this, this studio show is very important for us. Um, Chairman Mr. Uh, Yusri is really working on developing it. Um, and uh, another very important thing that's coming up as well is that we hope to um, publish in various languages, but that's a little bit uh, down the line, down the not line. right away. <laughs> I mean, we're seeing platforms like the Investigative Journal um, emerging from this, this sort of crisis that journalism mm -hmm. is facing and the need for these sorts of um, uh, you know, journals in, in a time like this when you can't get that kind of investigative journalism from mainstream. Are you hopeful for the future of journalism? Yes, I think uh, it is these cross-border investigative uh, journalism uh, uh, consortiums. We've had the Panama Papers, the ICIJ, OCCRP. We have phenomenal um, cross-border investigations going on, which are matching, as, as, as Maria Reza said, the, the level of organized cross-border crime and corruption and state complicity. Um, so they're, they're, meeting that, they're meeting that challenge. Um, and I think we've never seen better journalism than at this moment. Um, the problem is that journalists, as a result of getting so good at reporting on corruption and, and abuses, they are more vulnerable than ever. So we as human rights activists, as human rights lawyers, um, and at the international institutions, we need to also um, meet this challenge. Um, and so it's for that reason that we're over the week ahead and, and, and always calling on, on governments um, to really come back to this issue of impunity, to hold those accountable, to ensure that investigations and prosecutions are taking place, mm. to amend their laws, um, because we have a huge issue around extremely repressive uh, free expression um, laws in terms of defamation and, and terrorism. Um, and, and again, to this point, to, to release all detained journalists. Yeah, yeah. Not, yeah that's the number one mm. ask that should mm -hmm. come in tomorrow's uh, conference that's going to be for two days uh, because you know one of the, the, the very important initiatives that 
uh, my small foundation uh, supports and many people is the Reporters Without Borders initiative uh, calling on the United Nations to instate a special convoy that only deals with the issue of the safety of journalists. You have 340 journalists in prison today. That's a lot of emails. That's a lot of very worried moms. And you need to have that one person delegated from the UN to deal with these files. That's, mm -hmm. I'm totally on board for this campaign um, because I felt it when I was going through it. Um, you know, whatever government you're dealing with, there's still going to be bureaucracy. And to be honest, um, you know, th this uh, RSF campaign is something I'm, you know, push pushing for. And I think it's, um, uh, it could work in many cases because when two foreign ministers meet each other, they're still talking about trade and the arms deal. Are you gonna give me that ship? Are you gonna let this guy go? Well, this UN envoy is going to be, you know, I'm just here for one thing, get this guy out of prison. Let's hope that's what comes out of uh, tomorrow's conference. Uh, Mohammed and Sarah, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Can I now call on uh, Yusri Ishak, uh, the chairman and founder of the Drinks. Let's do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you.